We're so glad you're here tonight and looking forward to our next lesson in Esther. Um, I was thinking about the word sovereign this week. And Randy, who's taught kids forever and ever, says sovereign is God is in charge and he knows what he's doing. And that's how he teaches kids what sovereignty is. He's in charge and he knows what he's doing. And you know, when I can remember that, when I'm feeling like maybe he doesn't, but I know that he does, it changes everything. So I just think the whole story of Esther has felt like that to me, you know. God's name isn't even mentioned, but he's always in charge, mm -hmm. and he always knows what he's doing. Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful to be here and learn with you all tonight. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the way you take care of us and that you provide for us, God, in every circumstance. God, I thank you that you are in charge and that you know what you're doing. And God, I ask you to bring that to my mind over and over until it's so always for me that I can't think of it any other way. God, you are so good, and we are so grateful. Lord, use this time. Teach our hearts. Change us and make us more like your son. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good thing to keep in mind, God is in charge. He knows what he's doing as we cover what we're going to cover tonight. Um, have you ever read part of the Bible and gone through something and you go, I don't know what that means. <laughs> or maybe, why is that in the scripture exactly? Or maybe you understand exactly what it's saying, but your question is, really, God? <laughs> I mean, have you ever had those thoughts as you read scripture? Okay, be honest. Yes, all of us have had those thoughts. Uh, because there's some hard things in there. There's hard things to understand, hard things to grasp. And usually what we do when we come across those things is maybe we think about it for a minute, but mostly what we do. Yes, keep it, keep going, exactly. I have honesty here. <laughs> now, tomorrow, I go on to the next chapter, and I don't really think about it, because um, when you're studying uh, books, sometimes there's hard stuff in there, and it challenges us. But when we are, do, what we do in Cornerstone is when we go section by section, chapter by chapter, we're really not afforded the luxury of just skipping over stuff. <laughs> so it's there, you got to deal with it. And you got to uh, wrestle through it. And uh, hopefully in the process of wrestling that we learn something about God. We learn something about his purposes and something hopefully in, uh, in conjunction with that we learn something about ourselves. And uh, because I, I heard somebody once say, and I really like this idea, that the deep transformative things of God are not usually on the bottom shelf. Mm -hmm. They're not accessed by just bending over and grabbing. Sometimes you have to strain a little bit. Sometimes you have to reach on the top shelf and struggle a little, little bit to grasp hold of some of these harder concepts. So tonight in chapter 9 of Esther, we are going to strain a little bit. We're going to stretch a little bit. And uh, we'll tell you that almost every retelling of the book of Esther or the study of Esther just kind of skips over chapter 9. It's like they like to stop at chapter 8, and that is, you know, Haman is executed. Mordecai is elevated, and he comes up with this new law, and it kind of levels the playing field between the Jews and the Persians, and basically gives the Jews the same uh, authority or rights as, the, as Haman's law did. That is, you can defend yourself, and you can take your stuff. And uh, then there's kind of a silent hurrah that we have, that, it, oh, everything's all better now, and that's the end of the story, that, you know, they have the right, and then nobody attacks the Jews, and everybody lives happily ever after. That's really what that we're left with most of the time that you read the uh, people tell or talk about the book of Esther. But that's not what happens as what we'll see tonight. And so I want to deal with just this first section of chapter 9 tonight, some of the implications of that, kind of big picture stuff. I'm not going to talk about the details of the chapter very much. I want to pull it out to a bigger, broader concept and, and kind of wrestle through some of these things. And, you know, so chapter 9 kind of picks up with what we discussed last time in chapter 8. And, uh, and by the end of what we do talk about tonight, I hope that you'll see some of these bigger pictures in a better light. And I hope you've got your thinking caps on. <laughs> and uh, if you're too tired from work to process this, then I hope that you'll grab hold to a little something or a little something in our group and then go back and rewatch. Because as believers, we need to know how to answer questions that are kind of hard. Uh, that unbelievers might throw at us. Uh, so just to bring you up where we are in our story, uh, the fateful day has finally arrived. You remember all the way back in chapter 3, Haman has issued this decree to kill all the Jews because he's 
upset because Mordecai won't bow to him. And so he's going to wipe out the whole group of them with this, this law that he gets passed. And uh, you remember that he, they, he, they cast lots uh, to decide on the best day for this new edict to go into effect. And it, uh, casting lots, that is with the dice, or purr is what it's called there. It's, a di it's just the name for dice was a process of divination that they were going to their false gods and they're saying okay tell us the best day for this to happen so they cast lots 365 times one for every day of the year to pick out the best day for this to happen and it landed on the 13th day of the 12th month and here we are 11 months later from the time since chapter 3 fateful day has come and uh, last week we discovered like I said Mordecai came up with this new law and basically gave the Jews the right to defend themselves against the attackers. So when Haman's law goes into effect, Mordecai's law goes into effect at the same time. So here we go, chapter 9, verse 1. On the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, the edict commanded by the king was to be carried out. On this day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, but now the tables were turned. The other tables were turned. We talk about God being a God of reversal. Right there it is. The tables were turned, and the Jews got the upper hand over those who hated them. Verse 2, the Jews assembled in their cities and all the provinces of King Xerxes to attack those seeking their destruction. No one could stand against them because the people of all the other nationalities were afraid of them. So we see here the Jews defending themselves against anybody who would try to take advantage of Haman's law, try to kill them. Verse 3, all the nobles of the provinces, all the other important people there helped the Jews because the fear of Mordecai had seized them. And we see Mordecai become more prominent and more powerful through this. Then verse 5, the Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them. And they did whatever they pleased to those who hated them. Hard verse there. Verse 6, in the citadel of Susa, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. And they also killed uh, the ten sons of Haman, that's just a list of their names there. Son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews, but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. It's important verse there, keep that in your mind. Later on down in the text, you see that Esther asked Xerxes for another whole day uh, for the Jews to defend themselves. And we find out another 300 people within the city, a total of 800 people were killed uh, inside the walls of Susa. And... Uh, then we go jump down to verse 16 to see what happens in the rest of the kingdom. Meanwhile, the remainder of the Jews were in the king's provinces, also assembled to protect themselves and get relief from their enemies. They killed 75,000 of them, but did not lay hands on their plunder. Another reference, same thing a minute ago, but hard verse, 75,000 people killed. That's a lot of killing, a lot of death. This is not the only place in the Old Testament where this same kind of thing happens, right? If you've read any of the Old Testament, Joshua, Kings, Chronicles, these kinds of uh, uh, books, you see that a lot of destruction, a lot of commands by God to wipe out the aggressors uh, against Israel. And you may have heard people sometimes accuse God of being brutal and genocidal and refer to texts like this and like other places in the Old Testament uh, um, and those accusations come from people who kind of like to rip out a story out of the Old Testament and then start the accusations. And without a biblical foundation and understanding the full story of God, uh, we, you know, these stories offend our modern sensibilities, right? Well, wait, wait, what is God telling them to do? That doesn't seem right to us. And when people bring these charges against us, sometimes we as Christians stand there and stare at them, blink our eyes and have no idea what to say to them. Um, but these aren't just side issues. These aren't things we just need to skirt over the top of because it's, uh, uh, this reflects on the character of God. This is who God is. And so we need to understand why he would say these things and what was really going on there. And, um, because as the world becomes more hostile to Christianity and the th days become darker, we as believers must have reasoned answers for questions that people ask, genuine questions that people ask. Now, this doesn't mean you need to start an argument about this. You can tell, if you listen to the Holy Spirit, the difference between a genuine question and a mocker or a scoffer. So, but when people are genuinely asking, and we need to know for ourselves, right? So we are confident in who God is. 
And so uh, you need to be able to gently and respectfully carry on conversation with people who wonder about these types of things. It's a difficult subject, but we shouldn't be afraid to wade into these topics. So now remember the overarching question that you hear whenever you hear me talk, I say at least one time during, during a, a, a session, is the, when you read anything in scripture, what question do you need to ask yourself? What do I learn about God from this? What do I learn about God from this? And this is really important in a section like this or any other time you get to these sections in the Old Testament. And Because if we need to wrestle through this, if we just land on the surface of this question, we can come up with accusations against God too about being cruel or harsh or mean. Uh, it's like unbelievers do if we don't wrestle and get to the bottom of this question. So next week we'll go on in chapter 9 and we will talk about uh, the personal application of this chapter for our lives. But tonight I want to get to answer this, what do I learn about God from this, by posing two questions that maybe you've heard, maybe you've never thought about, but I want to answer these questions as best as I can, kind of big picture, overarching pictures, questions um, that surface from this text that requires some thinking on our part uh, to understand God's whole plan and what he was doing in the Old Testament versus the New Testament. And But what I want us to consider tonight are the answers to these two questions. Did God sanction the killing of innocent people when he commanded Israel to destroy their enemies? Did God sanction the killing of innocent people when he commanded in Israel to destroy their enemies? And number two, how do we understand this in the context of the larger story of God? All right, so the first thing to notice in this section is those two phrases I had used to, uh, when I was reading through this, the scripture to, to take note of, right? Three times it says in that, this passage in chapter 9 that, that uh, in verse 10, verse 15, and verse 16 that the Jews did not take the plunder of those who who attacked them. Okay, this is important now. It's easy to go right across that and not notice its significance because Mordecai's law, his decree, allowed them to take the plunder or the possessions of anyone who attacked them. It was written that way to mimic and give the, uh, the Jews all of the rights that Haman's law gave to the Persians. Now, uh, the fact that they didn't take the plunder indicates that maybe something else was going on in their minds than it looks like on the surface. Now, the Bible does not say this specifically or explicitly, so we're using some cross-referencing here, and we're kind of reading between the lines a little bit, so I need to jump through a, a couple of Old Testament passages, so stay with me. I was keeping in mind again, the Jews in Persia were given this right to defend themselves and to take the loot, okay? But they chose not to. Three times it says that. Now, the roots of this rejection of taking the plunder of, uh, goes, uh, uh, not taking the plunder of enemies goes all the way back to the story of Abraham and Lot. Now, uh, this is not a familiar story, so let me just summarize it really quickly. Lot was living in the, the, the city of Sodom, and a combined army of four kings came in and attacked Sodom. And they uh, uh, dragged away a bunch of their stuff and took a lot of people as captives, including Lot and his family. Now, when Abram, his name hadn't changed yet, this is Abraham, but when Abram heard about it, he gathered 318 of his men from his household, and they went and chased after these kings to free Lot. And they were successfully routed the, these attackers. Now, the king of Sodom was so grateful to what Abraham, Abram had done on behalf of his people that he, he, he told him, he said, go take whatever you want from the plunder of these, ki these kings. And in Genesis 14, verse 22 and 23, Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and have taken an oath. That I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or thong of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. This is the precedent right here. Uh, and you see it repeated over and over and over in the conquest of Canaan by uh, Joshua and with other places with the armies of, of Israel elsewhere. Whole cities, uh, when they went into Canaan, 
were just devoted to the Lord. All the loot went into the treasury. They were not allowed to take any of the, the, the plunder because the idea is no personal profit came from a mission given by God. This is the precedent here. And so now, did they always follow through on that? Absolutely not. Fast forward to the time of King Saul years later. Back, uh, we, we talked about this before, uh, that he, uh, when he was uh, told by God to wipe out the Amalekites, he failed in carrying out these instructions. And we talked about this a little bit uh, a few, uh, back early on in the sessions when we talked about why there was so much animosity between Haman and Mordecai, because Mordecai was from the family of Saul. Haman was an Amalekite, so that went all the way back to this moment. And, but Saul was commanded to kill everybody and not take any plunder. That his, his, he was to act as an agent of God's wrath against evil people who were attacking Israel. But Saul failed to follow God's command, uh, both by sparing the enemies of Israel and he kept the plunder and profited personally. If you remember quickly, look at this. Verse from 1 Samuel 15, Saul took Agag, the king of the Malachites, alive. All those people he totally destroyed, that was in the army, with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and the lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely. But everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. And if you remember the story, this is the par uh, part where Samuel shows up, confronts Saul, and says, Hey, what have you done here? And he responds by lying and rationalizing. And Samuel then kills the king, tells Saul that he's lost the kingdom by not following God's command. So moving forward in time up to Esther, where we are, Mordecai's decree allows for the taking of plunder of those who attack them. And it seems like the Jews understood the significance of what was going on enough to realize that there's this larger principle might be in operation. I mean, you almost have to believe that because why would people stop themselves from taking the plunder that they were given the rock opportunity to take by law? Uh, you know, take gold, silver, property. Your neighbor's dead from attacking you. Here's his sheep, his cattle, his gold, whatever it is. You, the law gives you a right to go over there and take it, but to choose not to uh, uh, seemed to indicate that they had to know that God was involved in the reversal, that God was the one who, who, who was working out these things for the nation of Israel, for them to voluntary, voluntarily choose not to profit from the eradicating of their enemies. I mean, they're basically effectively following the precedent that had been set down by God throughout the history of the Jewish people. Um, and so this, this action by them not taking stuff that they, that they could take was in fact giving credit to God for the reversals mm -hmm. and for their victory. So, okay, big question number one. Did God sanction the killing of innocent people when he commanded Israel to destroy their enemies? How do we come to terms with this kind of question when God clearly commands in all over the Old Testament uh, for God to destroy their enemies and completely wipe them out. Was God telling them to destroy the bad with the good? Well, I mean, weren't there some good people in those cities? I mean, that's a hard question, right? It seems like human reason would kind of tell you that maybe there were some good Persians out there. Maybe there were some good Amalekites or some good... People in Jericho or good Philistines, it seems logical, right? I mean, maybe there was a nice older lady who lived in Jericho there, and she made a mean loaf of bread, and she took care of the neighborhood children, and she was really nice. Did they need to kill her, too? Well, fortunately, we are not the first group of people to wrestle with this question of God uh, getting rid of bad and good people altogether, right? Go back to Abraham. Abraham, now his name has changed, uh, and the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. I know that story a little bit better, uh, but it's all a few chapters over from what I just told you just a second ago. From the from before those cities were destroyed, we have this interaction recorded in Genesis chapter 16 where Abraham pleads before God on behalf of the people, and he says this question: Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? That's the same question we wonder about, right? Would you? Have, why would you do that? Would you sweep away? The righteous with the wicked. And Abraham 
We have this bargaining session that happens between Abraham and God. And he's like, okay, God, well, if there's 50 righteous people in those two cities, will you spare them all? And um, then he goes down to 40, 30, 20. He gets down to 10. And he's like, if there's 10 righteous people in all of those uh, people that live in those two cities, will you save them all? But what happened? Next day, the cities were destroyed, turned to ash, right? So did God sweep away the righteous with the wicked? The answer is an emphatic no. He did not. There were no righteous people there. And we bristle against that thought, don't we? So wait a minute. In two whole cities, no righteous people? But here's where we use human reason to try to understand a concept, a spiritual concept, that is critical. Now, this is hard, but this is the truth. So stay with me here. Paul gives us the cold, hard fact of, in the answer to our questions about good and evil people. And he says in Romans chapter 3, we've already made the charge that the Jews and Gentiles, that's everybody, his people, and everybody who's who, who are uh, outside the Hebrews, they're all alike, and all are under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. Verse 23, all have sinned. It's, no one is righteous. All have sinned. This is clear that in and of ourselves, there are no righteous people. None. Zero. No righteous people. All the people are saved. All are guilty. All are born with the sinful nature residing within us. And so we have, sometimes have this misconception about what sin and evil is and where it is, right? We think sin and evil are these kind of these forces that are kind of, or concepts are kind of floating out there in the world somewhere. Maybe uh, and, and they exist somehow outside of their relationship to created beings, both people and angels, and that maybe somehow these abstract concepts might be hover out there somewhere floating around like giant bubbles or something, and that they bump into one person and attach to another person, and what we want is for God to destroy sin and evil but leave people alone, right? That's what we really want. Get rid of all that bad stuff but leave people alone. Oh, this is not the Star Wars universe, okay? <laughs> the force of sin isn't just flowing through the universe that some people tap into and other people don't. That's not what Scripture says. The reality is that sin and evil are within us. They reside in our hearts. We are born with it, and it dwells within us. And yes, the earth feels the effects of our sin, but that's because of us. And that it says the weight of sin, of our sin, the creation groans under it. So the moment Adam and Eve decided to disobey, that sin nature became a reality and it is passed on to every single human being that has ever lived. And the irrevocable punishment for this action has been decreed by God on them and every single descendant of them, including us. The Old Testament and the New Testament say the same thing. Ezekiel 18, the soul who sinned dies. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Now, what are wages? What are wages? Wages are what is paid for work done, right? Now, you go to work tomorrow, you're going to get paid your wages for the things that you have done, right? And the work done by sin, the sin that resides within us from birth, gets paid in Anytime that decree is postponed, even for a moment, it is the mercy of God. Every breath you draw is mercy. Every time you open your eyes in the morning, it is the postponement of the penalty of sin. Okay? Second Peter says it is the patience and mercy of God that holds back judgment so that the door of repentance can be opened. No one, not even the best, kindest, friendliest, most generous person out there, none are good compared to the righteous and holy standard set by God. 
Okay? Now, what we do is we confuse the difference between good and nice, right? Because mm -hmm. it's not the same, right? We look around, we see people that are nice, that help each other, that take care of their family, they're good citizens, that they have skills and talents that make them attractive, that have funny sense of humors and all that kind of stuff. They're really nice people, right? <laughs> but, and we see what's on the outside. And then we make assessments about what we see on the outside on what we think is on the inside. But that's not what the Bible says. You know, and I have a niece that says this very same thing. She says, I cannot believe in a God who would condemn my, uh, who would condemn my boyfriend. Because he's a really good person is what she says. And what she means by that is that he's really nice. That he takes care of her, he's fun to be around, all those kind of things. But nice is not the issue. Mm. Okay? Goodness is. Now, and the standard of comparison of what is good is the perfection of God. If we're not comparing to other people out there, we're comparing to God. And, uh, if you, and, and we're all out of the pool by that standard, right? None of us can even get even close to the We didn't even start in comparing to him. That, that, and so socially acceptable behavior and, and nice personalities and all that has never changed your standing with God, no matter how nice you are, right? If you, if you remember our study from last fall where we studied Galatians, right? We talked about the fruits of the Spirit, and one of those fruits of the Spirit is goodness. I mean, hardly anybody ever talks about that fruit of the Spirit. It's always self-control and faith and love and joy. But nobody talks about goodness, but this is really important to hear. Uh, our goodness isn't it something in and of ourselves. We don't have any goodness in us. We cannot produce it by being nice. Goodness sources itself from God, and it only comes from him. You know the story of the rich young ruler, when he approaches Jesus, the first thing he says to him is, his good teacher, what, should I must, what should, must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responds to him with this thing. He says, why do you call me good? No one is good but God. And of course, the irony there was he's trying to get, Jesus is trying to get the rich young ruler to understand that he's actually right, because he's talking to God, and he is good. But for our purposes tonight, the point is that Jesus wasn't just using hyperbole here. There is no one good but God. No one. And the only time anybody else is good and has any goodness in them is it's given to us by faith in Jesus Christ. We think we are clothed in his righteousness and goodness can flow through us because of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so no good people exist apart from the goodness that comes from God. Remember that. God's decree is just and deserved. We should be, as Haman's decree says, destroyed, killed, and annihilated. That's what we should get. That's exactly what we should get. But God's holy, but that's because God's holiness and righteousness demands it. He could have wiped us all out. However, in his great mercy, he built in. He built in time. And the passage of time gives a delay so mercy and grace can come. And so here's what we're going to bring in. Question number two. How do we understand this in the context of the larger story of God? We'll get to this one. So back in this chapter 9, I know you're probably going to say, wait, what does all, any of this have to do with Esther? But this is really cool. I love this part of Esther because what it shows us here, it is the picture of judgment and mercy in the great plan of God. That's what it shows us here. Remember, Haman's law brought death, right? Mordecai's law brought the counter offer of life. Like Haman's initial law, death is the creed that resides on every single sinner too. But instead of it being carried out universally like it could, Mordecai's law, like Mordecai's law, God offers, issues an offer, a counter offer of life. So God issues a counter offer of life. Of life, a plan to redeem us out from under that sentence of death and into the promise of deliverance. Now, uh, remember, like I've said for a couple of weeks now in a row now, Old Testament stories illustrate New Testament principles. Old Testament stories illustrate New Testament uh, principles. And the story Esther of Esther is preserved to show us a, a clear picture of these critical spiritual concepts. And if you, if you notice the parallel between the situation of the Jews in Persia and humanity as a uh, whole, I get this now, both decrees came from the same authority. Okay? The king's signet ring 
stamp and seal the decree of death and the counteroffer of life. Uh, and both came from the same authority ultimately. Just as Xerxes couldn't rescind the, or overlook the first law, God Almighty cannot just overlook that pronouncement of death on all of us either. That, uh, and, on, and on sin that was decreed in the Garden of Eden. Instead, God hinted at this counteroffer of life from the very, very beginning. Right when Adam and Eve in, uh, uh, sinned, God said the seed of the woman, that's a reference to Jesus right there, would crush the head of the serpent. And then it was God who slew, slew the animals and made skin to cover them. Both of those things pointed forward to the work of salvation that Jesus would do thousands of years later. So God issued a counteroffer of life stamped with the blood of Jesus. Nobody likes to talk about the wrath of God, probably the most neglected aspects of God's character. We like love and grace and mercy and compassion and, and uh, goodness. And in our minds, those things don't really seem to fit with wrath and judgment. However, if we look at our own justice system, we would, uh, we, we would never agree that a judge who ignored the law and allowed guilty people to go free would be good and righteous judge, would we? We wouldn't agree with that. Imagine if your child was the uh, victim of some heinous, horrible crime, terrible e evil, that they got caught the guy, they had all the evidence against him, and they found him guilty. The question of guilt was not even in, in the picture. It was clear. How would you react if the judge, judge at sentencing went, uh, you know, he's only done it two other times, so we're just going to let him go. It's all right. Um, it, you wouldn't think God, that judge was good or kind or righteous at all. You'd be outraged, right? You would be on a campaign to get this guy out of the justice system. Because justice is done when the appropriate sentence is carried out against violence, right? We all, we all we can see that and say, yes, that's exactly right what happened. Yet when God pronounces a sentence against those who do violence against him, we call him a monster. And really, uh, it ends up being self-motivated a lot of times. I mean, we don't want justice when it's applied to us, do we? <laughs> we want mercy. I won't give, mer give that guy justice, but give me mercy. But at the same time, we're conflicted, right? We agree that it's not right for a judge to go, no, you're good, you don't, need to, you don't need to pay for that. Because where's the justice for the offended? But in our case, God is the offended one, right? We, by our sin, we have committed high treason against our creator and a rebellion against him has a price justice for sin requires a death sentence remember salvation is not just getting a ticket to walk the streets of god fold salvation is being rescued from the terrible and real wrath of god directed towards sin and evil okay remember sin evil resides within us it's inside of us and god's wrath is directed at sin and evil and it is poured out necessarily on those people who are living under the sentence of death and who have rejected the counteroffer of life but here's the good news the full extent of god's wrath if you are a believer has not been poured out on you most famous verse in, verse in the scripture but it has been poured out and visited on his son God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, and whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And then verse 17 goes on to say, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. On the cross, Jesus, the wrath of God was poured out on him so we won't perish. That is die. That we won't have the death sentence carried out on us. We can come out from under that condemnation. Just like in Esther, both laws are enforced at the same time. The decree of death is still enforced in this world right now. Mm -hmm. But there's also issued that counteroffer of life. Just like what God did in Christ. Death reigns, but is set aside when we accept the offer, off, offer of life. So here's your parallel for why this passage matters. You cannot understand this passage or any other passage like it without a grasp 
of the big picture of what God is doing and what he's been doing all through the Old Testament. And Esther uniquely is given to us a picture of, of this story. And here's what was happening and why this book is so important and how we can understand what God is doing in these hard passages of scripture that we started out with. And that is that God was protecting his counteroffer of life, which wasn't fully realized yet during the Old Testament. That's what he's doing in, in, with these wipe out all the enemies things. Because since he brought Jesus through the, the, uh, the uh, family of Abraham and, and on down through the Jews, he was protecting that. Remember in the unfolding of time, Abraham's here, Esther's here. The cross is the way over here. <laughs> so it, 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 it happens later in time. And so before Jesus came, God's counter offer was inseparably bound to this group of Hebrews. And, and any time they were threatened by the Canaanites, the Malachites, the Persians here in Esther, or whether they wandered off into the sin and idolatry on their own, God sent judgment to protect them. And he did amazing things all through the Old, Old Testament to protect their, their, their survival. Lots of miracles happened and to ensure their survival and their purity to protect the offer that was to come later. So just like here in Esther, the reversals that were brought about so quickly were the hand of God working in the background, his sovereignty, protecting this offer of life that was yet to, to happen by assuring that this, the Jews would survive. In the Old Testament, stories like that can only rightly be understood within a story that reveals that God, who is committed to eradicating sin, offering humanity a chance at life, life lived abundantly in union and fellowship with our Creator. Read the Old Testament stories and wonder about what's going on with all this purging and these wars and all of this stuff going on. You must see it as God fiercely protecting his counter offer of life from every corruption. He, his own chosen people were not exempt from this. Ten tribes of the nation of Israel were carried off by the Assyrians and went away and were out of the story. They were dispersed. And he protected one tribe, the tribe of Judah, and kept them miraculously on many occasions so as to protect what he would offer later to all humanity through Christ's sacrifice. After the, auto, uh, uh, the offer was enacted, the cross and the resurrection, there were no more edicts or commands by God to do that Old Testament thing. You don't see nowhere in the New Testament do you find Paul or uh, Peter or John or any directive anywhere saying rise up to the new church and wipe out Rome or kill the Judaizers or false teachers, get rid of them. You don't see any of that. That's because uh, the call for them was not to be the agents of God's wrath anymore, but to be agents of God's grace. To tell people that the offer of life is here and how that it could be theirs. And so because, the, because once Jesus came, the offer of life was now and forevermore in effect. You see that? Does that make sense to you? And right here in the book of Esther is one of the most vivid depictions of the whole story of God. We as New Testament believers can point to it as a picture of what God did for us, to, did for us in Christ. You know, I, we're out from under death when we embrace that counter offer of life. This isn't just a book for Jews where we just celebrate that God miraculously saved them. And you know, it is part of the heritage for all believers in Jesus. Its significance is transformed from a celebration of a historical moment in time where the tables were turned and we go, yay God, you did an awesome miracle to a, a celebration of what we have in Jesus. The tables were turned on our spiritual enemy, the devil forever. Christ's crucifixion triumphed over death. And so there's so much more rich and full and deep for us as believers uh, and because the whole of this book is a deeper picture of what God has done in Christ. And we get what Jesus promised because I live. Mm -hmm. You will live. You will also live. You're out from under the decree of death. And you can have this today. If you haven't accepted this counter offer of life, you are still under the sentence of death. But you can step out from under that and 
any moment you choose the offer that he gives. Please talk to your group leader or somebody tonight before you leave here if you want to know more. If you have the offer, of, the counter offer of life is yours, you can celebrate. Because just like the, the, these Jews are going to celebrate coming up at the end of this chapter, you can be confident, you can be transformed. The hold on sin on your life is gone. It has no bearing on you. You are out from under that decree of death and have life eternal, starting right now. And what happened to you in the past or what you encounter in the future, it can't defeat you when you, uh, and you'll see that as we conclude chapter 9 next week and we make application to our lives. You don't want to miss those wonderful truths that we'll find out next week. But for now, we can thank God for the offer of life fiercely protected for us to embrace today. Amen? Amen? God, we just thank you that you are fiercely protected for us and that you have only good plan for us and that you love us so much that you won't allow sin to destroy us. God, I just so move. I have chills just thinking about how wonderful this story is and how that you gave it its full understanding in the cross of Thank you so much for just freeing us, for giving, taking the sentence of death for us and taking us out from under it. God, I just thank you so much for the, the stories that you give us and the truths that are embedded in them. God, help us to walk in that. Help us to believe it. Help us to know that only goodness resides in you. We pray this in the mighty, strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs>